lot of very interesting topics. So the first speaker is uh, Vicky Caspi, uh, and uh, she will tell us about fast radio bursts. Please, Vicky. Uh, so uh, it's a great honor, uh, pleasure to be here in uh, your beautiful city of Rome and this beautiful room. Uh, and I'm here to tell you about fast radio bursts. Uh, basically, this is a relatively recently recognized new astrophysical phenomenon which we do not yet understand. It is uh, a puzzle. So what's, what are fast radio bursts? These are very brief, that is, few millisecond, and perhaps in some cases even shorter, bursts of radio waves. Uh, the first, and these are coming from all over the sky, uh, the first one was detected or reported in 2007 by Lorimer and collaborators uh, from data taken at the Parkes Observatory, which is, uh, you can see there, in Australia. Uh, we call that the Lorimer burst. Uh, but today, there's about 30 of these events have been recorded and reported, although there's some, still some uh, that are not yet published. Uh, even though over the last decade, about 30 of these events have been seen, one can estimate the sky rate to be very large, something on the order of 1,000 per sky per day. Uh, this is something that is happening constantly, and the reason we've only detected a few is because radio telescopes like Parks have a small field of view and are not always observing. These are, all, these are uh, extragalactic and almost certainly as a class cosmological, and that might seem uh, like quite a, you know, quite a claim, and I hope in this talk to, to demonstrate that to you. <coughs> We do not know what they are, so their origin is unknown, uh, and I would love to talk to you all about the different models for FRBs, but the next talk by Bing Zhang is, is going to do that, so I'm going to stay pretty observational. So what does one of these things look like? This is the Lorimer burst, and I want to show you some very specific features about it. So this plot has... Um, radio frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. This radio frequency, this is about 300 megahertz, centered at 1.4 gigahertz. And what you can see is that the burst sweeps through the band, that is, it arrives at high frequencies before low frequencies. And this is, a, this is dispersion, very commonly uh, observed in galactic radio pulsars. It's due to plasma, that is the ionized component of the interstellar median, uh, usually for pulsars in our galaxy. And this uh, dispersion effect, you, uh, we always have to correct for this. I'll explain a little bit more detail. But if you correct for it and you remove this effect, that is you line this up in software after the fact and sum it all up, you can see the, the burst. Uh, you see there's basically just noise, the burst, and then it goes away. And uh, for Lorimer burst, it does not come back. So the dispersion of radio waves, uh, it's a, one, a cold plasma dispersion. The standard law is a 1 over frequency squared law. And the Lorimer burst and FRBs in general, that dispersion sweep is exactly 1 over frequency squared, as you expect for cold plasma dispersion. And, and this constant of proportionality between the time delay at any two frequencies uh, is the dispersion measure and is equal or is proportional to the integrated electron density along the line of sight to the object. So it's the sum total of all the free electrons that the radio waves encounter on their path from the source to us. And it's this dispersion measure that is telling us these objects are most likely cosmological, and let me explain. From studies of the 2,000, 2,500 known galactic radio pulsars, uh, we know, roughly speaking, the electron content and distribution in the Milky Way galaxy. This is the standard model that people have been using for years. This is top-down view of the Milky Way in the galactic plane, but the model is three-dimensional. You can see the spiral arms, the galactic centers here, we're here. 
And uh, these contours are contours of constant dispersion measure in arcane units that are parsecs per centimeter cube. So that in any direction in the Milky Way galaxy, if you measured the dispersion measure, that is, the rate of that 1 over frequency squared sweep when a broadband pulse arrives at a radio telescope, you can infer the, the distance. So if you measure for a galactic pulsar a dispersion measure of 150 in this direction, you know it's roughly that far away. Uh, but what's important for fast radio bursts is that the same model that we have relied upon and is pretty well calibrated using pulsars that have independent distance estimates. The model for any line of sight, both in the plane and anywhere out of the plane, has a maximum, uh, a ma maximum that can be ascribed to the galaxy. And that's, that's crucial. So for the lower, Lorimer burst, in the direction of the burst, the maximum from the fairly well calibrated model is 25 in those DM units, whereas the Lorimer burst dispersion measure was 375, so way larger than anything the galaxy can provide. And uh, when the uh, authors of that paper first noticed this, uh, you know, they were very excited because it implied pretty strongly that it has to be extragalactic. Now, you might wonder, well, couldn't there be an intervening line of sight compact H2 region or some, some other object that could provide the extra electrons? And there's long arguments against that because such an object would also emit free free emission, H alpha emission, nothing is seen. Now, so that's the, one of the strongest arguments in favor of these being extragalactic. Uh, you might wonder, now that we have 30 of them, what does the sky distribution of these events look like? This is the sky distribution of galactic coordinates. Uh, you can see it's, you know, all over the place. Certainly nothing to do with the galactic plane. You might think it's a little lopsided in galactic coordinates, but this is because the vast majority of the known FRBs has been discovered at the Parkes Telescope, which is in Australia and can't see the northern sky. So that totally accounts for the fact that we're missing uh, certain regions of the galaxy. And as I'll describe, upcoming Northern Hemisphere FRB detection experiments are soon coming online and should fill it all out. Uh, so the dispersion of the radio waves suggests the extragalactic origin. The isotropic sky distribution suggests a cosmological origin. Uh, the dispersion measure distribution of the known fast radio bursts is plotted here. Uh, and interestingly, the arrow is showing you where the Lorimer burst lies. And you can see, over the past decade, the FRBs that have been detected have very high dispersion measures indeed. And uh, you know, the highest one, uh, it, its galactic um, uh, contribution is also very low. So you can see that the arguments that hold for the Lorimer burst hold even more so for all the rest of the FRBs that we've detected so far. Uh, if indeed they're cosmological, there have been many authors that have shown uh, that they would make, that they potentially could be very interesting cosmological probes. So just to quantify this a bit more, we think that the dispersion measure of the FRBs, after you subtract the galactic contribution, um, models for the intergalactic medium suggest there are free electrons there and that the relation between the total column depth and distance, a redshift, is about 1,200 uh, re times redshift in DM units. Uh, so if you subtract for the Lorimer burst the galactic contribution of 25 and then plug in the remaining dispersion measure, you get a redshift of 0.3, so indeed cosmological, uh, which corresponds to about a gigaparsec. Uh, but this is uh, almost certainly an upper limit because probably the FRB source is in some galaxy, which itself has an interstellar medium that contributes to the dispersion measure. So we believe the total dispersion measure that we detect when that sweeps through the radio band is equal to the Milky Way contribution, the intergalactic medium contribution, and some unknown contribution from a host galaxy, which, from our knowledge of the Milky Way galaxy, is, not ex is you know, on the order of a few tens unless 
it happens to be in a large spiral galaxy viewed edge on. That could contribute a lot of dispersion measure or near the center of the galaxy. But if it's not in any special location, this number shouldn't be very large. But still, if you, for the Lorimer burst, subtract the Milky Way contribution of 25, and then let's say you divide the remaining dispersion measure equally between the intergalactic medium and the host galaxy, oh, that gives you 500 megaparsecs, still pretty far, and also sets, roughly speaking, the energy scale for the, uh, for the source. Uh, for the Lorimer burst, about 10 to the 40 ergs, uh, or 10 to the 43 ergs per second. That's an important model constraint. Now you might say, why don't you just look and see, is there a host galaxy there? And the problem is that radio telescopes, single dish radio telescopes, have very large fields of view. So this is the field of view of the Parkes radio telescope, and you can see, you can go and look, but there's thousands of galaxies, you can't possibly know which is the counterpart, or which is the origin. And to uh, single dish radio telescopes are diffraction limited. So even if you go to a much larger telescope, like the Arecibo telescope, the field of view is still too large to be able to unambiguously identify a host galaxy. The VLA, on the other hand, if you went um, at these frequencies and you know, depending on what array it's configured in, uh, then you'd be in business. You would be able to localize the sources. Uh, the problem is that as you, you know, the better you can localize, uh, the smaller your field of view is. So radio telescopes that are good at detecting fast radio bursts are not good at localizing them. And conversely, radio telescopes that are good at pinpointing them are very poor detectors because their fields of view are so small and the probability of them detecting an FRB is small, although people are trying. Um, so let me tell you about uh, one particularly interesting fast radio burst that, that my group has done work on, FRB 1211.02. This one was found using the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. Uh, in fact, it is currently the only one observed from Arecibo. Uh, and it was the first non-Parks FRB, which was a bit of a relief because some were concerned that perhaps it was something specific to the telescope, which would not be very good. Uh, but we found one at Arecibo, so everybody was quite excited. And you can see here the telltale dispersion sweep, although it fades at lower frequencies, which was interesting. This is the sum after you do de-dispersion, that is, subtract off that, uh, correct for the sweep. You can see a nice pulse. The dispersion measure here was 558, which was three times the maximum dispersion measure along the line of sight. Uh, we noted the unusual spectrum. In radio astronomy, you don't often see spectra that rise with radio frequency. That's unusual. But we concluded at the time that that's, and, and the spectral index, that is, if you describe the flux as a function of frequency with a power law, had a spectral index of plus 9, which seemed crazy to us. So we assumed that it had to do with a, it being in a, in a uh, region of the beam. Uh, that is, it didn't hit in the center of the radio telescope's beam. It hit on the edge near, in a side lobe. Which for a, if you took a flat spectrum source, uh, you could get a strong positive spectral index um, in some regions of the beam, so it's, it's not crazy. Um, we were quite excited. We found the first non-Parks FRB, and then to our amazement, uh, we, well, we, we kept observing this source. Um, even though people had kept observing the Lorimer burst part of the sky and also other Parks um, uh, FRBs and never seen another burst. So, you know, FRBs, as far as we knew, went off and then you never saw them again. But to our amazement, um, we checked, we, did our <laughs> we didn't think we'd see it, but the fast radio burst from Arecibo repeats. This is um, uh, quite exciting. This is the original one that we detected. That was the very first burst with a strongly positive spectral index. And these are uh, a sample of other bursts that we've now detected. Uh, and in this plot, just to avoid confusion, they have been de-dispersed already. So uh, the dispersion sweep has been corrected for in software so that the bursts now appear vertical in frequency time space. Uh, and the repeat bursts are always at approximately the same dispersion measure. So we're sure it's the same source. And I say approximately to within a percent. And you can see that bursts have different morphologies. There's some incredibly bright bursts. 
um, and some bursts that have <laughs> exactly the opposite spectrum from what we initially observed. In this case, they were all located at the same position in the beam, so we then immediately knew that this could not possibly be um, a beam effect. It, it's intrinsic to the source. The spectrum changes radically from burst to burst. Uh, so <laughs> obviously, uh, you know, one, there were two classes of models. Uh, the, the most common model that was described in the literature and, and uh, discussed was some sort of cataclysmic model for FRBs, explosion of a star, collisions of stars. Uh, obviously, if something's repeating, it, all the cataclysmic models are immediately ruled out for this source. We can't say they're ruled out for all sources, and I'll come back to that. So obviously, very constraining observation. And uh, this was about, we detected uh, something like 10 bursts in 2016, 10 repeat bursts. Since then, we've seen hundreds of bursts from the source. And they have a very wide variety of, uh, bursts, uh, of uh, morphologies, spectra, they, um, but all, always at roughly the same dispersion measure. Um, oh yeah, and I should also mention the bursts come in clusters. The source has, a, has active days. It'll go for a month without, you, without showing any bursts, and then suddenly you'll see, you know, 20 in one day. No evidence for periodicity. This we've looked at over and over and over again. Uh, some of the bursts are, come within ten, a few seconds of each other, uh, and still no evidence of periodicity. Uh, so the repeater, in addition to immediately ruling out cataclysmic models, also offered a tremendous opportunity to then go to an interferometer and try and localize it, which is what we did. So the Jansky Very Large Array uh, observed the field of, the, uh, of FRB 121102. Um, this is computationally extremely demanding because you're looking for very brief bursts um, in many, many um, uh, pixels, uh, effectively um, um, created pixels of, of VLA observation. This is really not an easy experiment, and Casey Law and collaborators uh, really have, have um, enabled this at the very large array. We've partnered with them for that. Uh, and we stared at the source for a very long time, um, and it did not cooperate. Uh, <laughs> that just happened. So in the fall of 2015, we looked for 10 hours, we saw no burst. 2016, 40 hours, we saw no burst. We were getting a little nervous. Um, uh, and luckily, they didn't cut us off. And <laughs> in fall 2016, uh, we got another 40 hours. And in the first hour of a test observation, uh, we detected um, actually nine, nine bursts. So uh, and this is now uh, VLA data. You can see the error circles. Um, so the, the repeater at Arecibo was actually detected in two separate locations. So those are the error circles. And you can see um, the VLA position right there, and the burst detected with the VLA at the same dispersion measure, unambiguously the same source. Um, oops. Sorry. Sorry. There. Um, so we saw nine bursts in fall 2016, which gave us a localization to 0.1 arc seconds. That's what we wanted. Uh, there's the position. Uh, first of all, we realized at the position of the burster, there is a persistent radio source, typically at about 200 Janskys. Uh, and you can see it's actually quite variable. So the black data points are the flux from the persistent source. The red triangles are the burst that we observed. So there does not seem to be any sort of correlation between when the source bursts and the flux of the persistent source. And we don't know what the persistent source is. Uh, but in any case, uh, having the arc, so that's interesting, <laughs> a clue, uh, having the um, uh, arc second, uh, 0.1 arc second localization allowed us to go to the 8 meter Gemini telescope where we could look and uh, observe a very faint uh, optical counterpart. A 25th magnitude dwarf galaxy for which we subsequently measured the redshift to be 0.2. So all the inferences on the basis of the dispersion measure, subtracting off the galactic contribution, et cetera, et cetera, were correct. We have verified for this source, oops, whoops, sorry. Uh, we have confirmed that this source is at a cosmological distance. And we got a lot of press out of this. Um, 
The famous New York Times science writer Dennis Overby said, radio bursts traced in faraway galaxy, but color is probably ordinary physics. Uh, I'd like to bring one to his house and explode it in the middle of the night and see how ordinary he finds it. Uh, and meanwhile, the New York Post said, scientists say radio signals could be aliens. So I, don't know, I don't know why they said that. Uh, more recently, FRB 121102 has also exhibited another very surprising feature. Uh, if you remember uh, Faraday rotation, uh, that's uh, basically the uh, linear polarization angle rotates um, as a function of radio frequency uh, due to uh, propagation of the radio wave through a magneto-ionic medium. So rotation measure is equal to the integral of line of sight magnetic field times electron density. And um, uh, so for polarized sources, you can do this experiment. We didn't actually recognize initially that the repeater was polarized, uh, but then a search in, very high, in a very wide rotation measure space revealed that the rotation measure was, was um, 150,000 in, um, uh, in rotation measure units, which is among the highest rotation measures ever measured for any source, and that was quite exciting um, and got us um, uh, back on the cover of Nature, and actually, we were very excited, by the way, that uh, Arecibo was on the cover of Nature, because Arecibo had just suffered considerable damage in Hurricane Maria. So we were very proud to, to help them out. Uh, um, and uh, in any case, um, once you correct for the rotation measure, we realized, uh, and this is beautiful work done by uh, Daniele Michili, who's here at the meeting, gave a very nice talk about this the other day, uh, that the pulses are 100% linearly polarized, and some are as narrow as 30 microseconds after you correct the rotation measure. And this is uh, a plot just showing how unusual this rotation measure is. This is, you can't quite see it, but it's dispersion measure on the x-axis over three orders of magnitude and rotation measure on the y-axis. And the black dots are all galactic radio pulsars for which both have been measured. And FRB 121102 sits way up high in this parameter space. And the only thing even close is this object over here, which is the magnetar that is known in the center of the galaxy. There's a magnetar that's at the Sagittarius A, very close to Sagittarius A star, and it also has a very uh, high rotation measure. And so, you know, this high rotation measure is suggestive of some po possibly presence near a supermassive black hole, um, but, you know, we don't really know that. So where do we stand? Uh, at least one FRB is proven cosmological, but there's many open questions. Uh, is it representative? Are all FRBs repeaters? Well, people have been looking at the other FRBs, and no one has seen another repeat yet, in spite of hundreds, thousands of hours of repeat of, of multiple observations. So perhaps there's multiple classes. Um, but is it a coincidence that the only known Arecibo FRB is also the only known repeater? Is that a coincidence? Um, Arecibo is very sensitive, and many of the repeat bursts could not have been detected by the Parkes telescope. So perhaps it's not a coincidence. Uh, we don't know what the burst source is, but everything, to me, points to a compact object. You have 30 microsecond pulses, uh, something uh, along the lines of a neutron star or a black hole, and you have such large brightness temperatures, some sort of coherent emission also seems inevitable, uh, but I'm going to leave that for Bing Zhang to discuss. Uh, we don't know what the persistent source is. We don't know what the source of the rotation measure is. Um, interestingly, su super luminous supernovae are... Um, uh, also found in dwarf galaxies that are very similar to the one that the FRB, that this repeating FRB is in, so perhaps there's a connection. We heard a very interesting talk about that uh, on Tuesday by Ben Margalit. Um, so how are we going to make progress on this? Uh, you know, when you have a transient uh, source population, you need a telescope that can look everywhere all the time. Uh, luckily, there's a whole bunch of new FRB detectors that are either online or coming online, and here the names are color-coded. Green is online, yellow is coming online, and uh, red is uh, under um, consideration being designed. So we heard a nice talk the other day about Aperitif uh, that's uh, in the Netherlands by uh, Liam Connor. Utmost is uh, Matthew Bales and collaborators in Australia. There's Lofar. Uh, we heard a nice talk by Manisha Kalib, but Meerkat in South Africa, ASCAP also in Australia. Um, and the other one that's coming online is the CHIME telescope in Canada, and that's what I'm involved in and what I'm going to tell you a little bit about in the last few minutes. So CHIME, 
is the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, uh, which doesn't sound related to FRBs, but I'll explain in a minute. It's located in Penticton, British Columbia at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory. And it's a very unusual design for a radio telescope. It consists of four cylinders, each measuring 20 meters by 100 meters, and you can see them here. So it's 100 meters, so the total collecting area is comparable to the Green Bank Telescope. Um, in Canadian units, it's five hockey arenas. Um, it is, there's no moving parts. It's a transit telescope, so it observes only what's directly overhead. The cylinders are all oriented exactly north-south, so that the, uh, the sky sweeps, uh, sweeps east-west. Uh, along the axis of each of these cylinders are hanging 256 uh, dual polarization feeds sensitive in the 400 to 800 megahertz range. So we have a total of 2,048 input signals going into a massive correlator, the largest correlator uh, in the world. Uh, and what all of this with the strange geometry gives you, and just to set the scale, you could see our team standing uh, along the axis of one of the cylinders. And what this um, strange geometry gives you is tremendous field of view. So in, you know, there's, no, there's only focusing in the east-west direction, so the east-west beam, depending on frequency, is about two degrees. There's no focusing, it's a cylinder, along the north-south direction, so you can see something like 120 degrees of sky. So it's over 200, 200 square degrees of field of view compared to you know, a few arc minutes for a single-dish radio telescope. So collaboration involving the University of British Columbia, McGill University, University of Toronto, um, Perimeter, NRAO, WVU, DRAO, and I just want to highlight the many students and postdocs who are working very hard on this project and without whom it would not be moving forward. So how does this work? If you put one antenna on a cylinder, you would just see one large beam north-south uh, on the sky. If you populate the antenna with many, uh, if you populate the, the axis with many antennas, uh, we do a Fourier transform in the north-south direction, and that gives us 256 beams in that 120-degree field of view. Each, so, and that's all done by the correlator simultaneously. So this diagram is only showing you a few feeds. We have 256, so there's many more beams north-south. And then if you populate all four of the cylinders with, um, uh, with antennas, then you get east-west resolution as well. So each of these beams is like having a Green Bank telescope. So it's like having 1,000 Green Bank telescopes, 1,000 100-meter aperture telescopes, all observing independent regions of the sky at the same time. Uh, now, um, Canadian, the hydrogen intensity mapping experiment, the telescope was not designed, was designed with cosmological um, observations in mind. It's meant in the, using the 400 to 800 megahertz range to be mapping redshifted hydrogen in the redshift range 0.8 to 2.5 to study baryon acoustic oscillations and uh, the, uh, understand um, basically dark energy and the accelerating expansion of the universe. Uh, so that's, what, uh, you, it's, that's a very interesting experiment on its own, which I'm not involved in, um, but we realized that the same telescope at the same time could study fast radio bursts. And so you can ask how, how well can CHIME do? This is a plot of bursts per hour on the x-axis with observing frequency on the y-axis, and you want to be very far to the right on this plot. That's a high detection rate. Uh, and you can see CHIME is... Um, uh, can be a very powerful, uh, the, the powerful FRB detector with, uh, you know, uh, between a few to a few dozen FRBs per day. We compare with 30 in the last decade. Uh, there's a large uncertainty on that because most FRBs were detected at 1.4 gigahertz, whereas we're at 400 to 800 megahertz. So you have to extrapolate in frequency, and uh, that that's, uh, there's some uncertainties involved with that. Uh, just very quickly, the CHIME system diagram, to just give you a feeling for what we're doing here, there's four cylinders, uh, the to and the correlator is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with radio cor correlators, is a hybrid FX engine uh, correlator that involves field programmable gate arrays and 256 GPUs uh, with an input data rate of 13 terabits per second. This massive input data rate, we can't possibly save that. Everything is done in real time. 
The three experiments occur simultaneously is the cosmology experiment, the baryon acoustic oscillation, sky mapping, and the fast radio burst. And we also have a pulsar back end that we can observe 10 pulsars um, per, um, uh, simultaneously. Uh, very quickly, just, uh, yeah, well, there are, I'll just go, I see I'm running out of time, I just want to show you uh, the status. Um, it is now operating, the telescope is built, the FRB back end is online, it's mostly functional. Uh, we have 99 of the 130 dispersion and detection nodes that are required after the correlator to detect FRBs, they're mostly operating, and, um, uh, but we are commissioning it, uh, debugging it. The pipeline is working, and uh, we've detected single pulses from uh, radio pulsars, from galactic radio pulsars. And there's many of those. It's very easy to detect them. Every, so it's just a good test of our pipeline. And you can see here what the chime sky looks like to us. Very quickly, this is several hours of data. So this is time on the x-axis. And this is beam number in the north-south direction on the y-axis. And each of these little horizontal lines is a pulsar that's drifting through the beam. So we get a beautiful view of the sky. The arc there is the very bright northern pulsar, 0329 plus 54. So conclusions. Uh, fast radio bursts are, you know, they're, they're real, they're here to stay. The origin remains unknown. There may well be multiple classes of these objects. Uh, the first localization is accomplished and confirms cosmological distance, and there's many new FRB detectors about to come online. Uh, and um, I will stop there and let you see a, a fun drone flyby of the CHIME telescope. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, you didn't emphasize it, but what is the energy or the luminosity of this? Uh... So, the, for, so for the Lorimer burst, it was about 10 to the 43 ergs per second. Um, some of the uh, more distant ones would be even brighter. So even it's more. not like a gamma ray burst. It's not in but the same it's league. But it's pretty high. But it's pretty high. Yeah. Yes. Questions, please. Yes. Is, uh... So now we have to. Yes. Big, we have to use this. What's, what makes you think that uh, FRBs are particularly interesting cosmological probes? Ah, because um, they're probing the ionized component in the inter interstellar medium. You can measure rotation measures, and so, for, so different studies will show, for example, um, different dispersion measure distributions depending on the size of galaxy halos, how many galaxies, the size range of galaxies. So there's studies that, sh you know, depending on large-scale structure, you'll get different dispersion measure distributions. You can probe the intergalactic um, magnetic fields. More questions? Comments? Yes. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm arrived a little bit late. Uh, have you talked about uh, search for counterparts in the X? Uh, optical band and the results are if there are. Yeah, so many groups, including Manisha, who's giving the microphone around, have done some uh, <laughs> important work looking for um, optical counterparts. Uh, part of the problem is that most of the FRBs that we know of were detected long after hmm. the event. Uh, in data. So, so real-time systems have only recently come online, and uh, in the few cases where they've been uh, found them in real time, the error regions are also quite large. But still, you could look for a transient, and, and none has been seen. Uh, for the repeater, there you have a real chance, um, because it's always going off, or often going off, and we've stared at it with the Chandra X-ray Observatory and uh, haven't seen anything. Oh. But the upper limit on the X-ray emission is not very constraining if you, if you took you know, the brightest known magnetar from the galaxy and you put it at a redshift of 0.2, you wouldn't have been able to see it. But is it monitored? I mean, people uh, keep looking at that? In x-rays? Yes. Uh, not, not really. I mean, the, not really. Uh, the, the all-sky monitors could, but they're no, not I know, but it's the, yeah. I think Shanta should give a look. Uh, well, we, we looked and saw nothing. That, yeah. yeah. And, oh, I should emphasize, we saw nothing even though the Chandra observation overlapped with a radio burst. Okay, so if there are no more urgent questions, let's thank Vicky again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.